Hello once again everyone, another week, another video. So today I wanted to take the time to discuss Opnamen and dealing with Opnamen because I've mentioned it a lot recently, that one, two, as kind of everyone's first combination. So I wanted to take time to really go over it and go over some suggestions for how to deal with it because it's really gonna be one of the most common things that you deal with when it comes to longsword. For that, I brought in a little bit of help. This is Jake, one of my guys. It's his first time on the channel and I'm gonna hit him a bunch. But so first off, let's talk about the two different kinds of opnamen that you're going to be dealing with and your responses therein. So the very first one we're going to talk about is how to get to opnamen. So you're both in Vomtag, and it doesn't matter if he attacks first or if I attack first or whatever, but we come to a bind, boom, and I have one, right? Significantly. If I'm kind of in the middle here, he shouldn't be doing opnamen, and if he does, I should just stab him and, and move. But I've won, my point is kind of over his shoulder, this is when he's going to be pulling back and cutting around. Now the first one he's going to do is he's going to push on his pommel and slide up my blade until he's free, then he steps around and he cuts me. Now this one I call the V up Naaman. It is closer in my opinion to what is actually described in the sources. And the reason that he's sliding up my blade is because he's deceiving me feeling wise. So to show what that looks like, if we both come to a bind here, boom, and I'm the one who's lost. Right? A good way for me to get control over this is to move my strong back to his tip, from which I could then work back into the bind or do whatever I'm going to do. Now, he's confident. He's like, aha, I'm sliding up to here. He's going to keep the pressure on this side to prevent that from happening. So when I slip off, that's where his energy is still going. That's how this works, and it's, it's a very good deception. So that's why I'm sliding up the blade, is so that way from his perspective, it's like, I've still got it. And people will even still chase that bind. Um, you will meet fencers who are like, I want the sword, I want the sword, I want the sword. Why are you hitting the head? Right? That will happen. So, we come into bind, I win, he slides up and then around. It makes a very tight sort of V shape. And usually, depending upon how far he steps, he's going to be pretty tight to you. This is a pretty tight one. He may be slightly more off at most, but usually it's going to be about this sort of distance. Uh, maybe a little bit further here and there, depending upon who you're fighting. That means we've got a very small tempo to deal with. So the best thing for me to do is, since the cut is coming from this side, and we've talked about hourglass fencing before, he's taking that line on the hourglass, I need to take the opposite one to beat him. So I'm going to move with his cut. So we come into bind, boom, as he starts moving, I need to be stepping up this way, so that way I can line my core up with him again, and have some room to move. I'm buying myself time as this cut is coming down. Now the next most important thing is do not try to parry it with your short edge. It's not that you can't. You can, and if you do something along the lines of a crump pal, it can actually be pretty strong. But that's getting into more complicated stuff, and usually I find risking the short edge, it's less that he's gonna bind against it, and more that you're just not going to save yourself in time, and rather than hitting you in the head, it's just gonna clip you in the arms, the hand, or something along those lines. I want to make a hard, parry to this side that is not going to fail me. So instead of trying to do this, I'm going to move my true edge, my long edge, over to the side. So now it's lined up with my core, and I'm as strong as I can be on this side. So let's show that part again. We're here, come to bind, right there. Now this is basically where we were, just on the other side, and now I have my options. So our first option is the simplest one, it's just a parry then a cut. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to meet it out like this. I'm even going to add a little bit of pop to it to give me a bit more pressure. Then I'm going to just turn with the pommel and step with a cut. From here I can either keep going or I can just compass step to face him again. Now I want to give it that pop because preferably what I'd like to see happen is this. See how his sword moved quite far to the side? The reason that happened is because as he came around, I popped kind of into his flat slash the corner of his edge. That causes his wrist to turn over. Now you will not always get that same effect, and it can even come down to what swords you're using. He is using uh, the Arms and Armor, is it Fector Book or Fector Spiel? Fector Spiel. Spiel. And I am using the uh, Albion Leaknauer. These are both pretty beefy swords. They will tend to knock smaller swords away. Versus if you are dealing with some, some even beefier ones like Choblowski's or even some Reganyes or things like, or Ensifers, 
you may have a little more difficulty knocking them away. So you need to fight against many different swords and see what feels right. But otherwise, the principle is still pretty much the same. We come in, here, pop, get myself as big of an opening as I can while I step away from him using my long edge and just turn, cut, and get out. Very simple sort of motion. Now, that one's a good one, and it usually hits someone in the face, which is excellent. The downside of it is that it's usually not going to get you any control points. So if you haven't fought before, control points are ones that are achieved by having active control of his blade in some way, and they're usually worth the most points. Now, a good way to get around this is to use a thrust instead. So same basic idea, but now I'm going to go for a thrust, which is also usually more deadly anyway. So we come into bind, boom, he goes to scope around, I'm going to catch it, same idea but no pop this time. Once I catch it, I'm going to lift my pommel and do a small advancing step as I plunge down into his, uh, his breast. Now, important things to remember when you do this. Number one, make sure that your posture is upright and that you're actually keeping pressure here. Don't let your arms relax as you try to move in. Number two, make sure that your cross guard is still at that 45 degree angle. Otherwise, he's going to slip down and hit your fingers or something along those lines. And number three, I usually like to plunge down into the breast area. The reason I do that is because in training, we usually hit the head because we're you know wearing like this sort of clothing and just masks. That's great, but in competition, I find that it has the tendency to slip off and not be seen. And then if you have a rubber on the end, it can stick and jam someone's head back, which is an injury we've been dealing with quite a lot in HEMA recently. So I prefer to thrust down into the chest where it will be seen, where it will have the less potential of injury. And also, that's what the texts say to do. They say to plunge down into the breast as opposed to stabbing them in the face more often than not. So, you know, there's a lot of important stuff there. People don't usually enjoy getting stabbed there. So, here's that once again. We come into bind, boom, here as I move, up and in. Now, once you're here, you're not going to be leaving. There is, I mean, you can withdraw from here, but it's not a smart idea. Stay in, keep pressure. He's locked out, he can't really do a whole lot. So, that's your second option. Gets you a little more points. A little harder to do, but gets you a little more points. Now let's talk about changing this into something that's really, really good. So we're gonna take it from two time action to one time action. So what's gonna happen here is I'm basically going to go from long and orts to aux in one motion. This will require me to take a much tighter and bigger step upwards, as well as to extend my arms a lot more because what I gotta do is I gotta kinda scallop slash scoop his incoming blade. So here's what that looks like. Boom, there. Now, you'll notice my arms are a lot more extended, but my point is also going a lot further. Now, I didn't step up quite as far as I'd want to for that one, but this would definitely threaten his face, probably lead to him parrying, and then I cut him on the other side. If I step up a little tighter this time, it should work a little better. There it is. So notice how I jammed into his motion as fast as I could, and my arms extended hard, so that way he slipped. Usually into the cross guard, sometimes they'll just get stuck out here. It can vary. But you want to be basically doing the same idea as what you did before, but rather than block, then drop, it's everything out into ox in one go. It's a very, very good uh, one-time counter. It takes a little bit of practice, and depending upon the forearm guards you're wearing, you may or may not actually be able to get into that good of a right ox, as you can definitely attest to right now, Jake. So, depends. That option may not be available to you. However, even if you're in big beefy forearm guards, you should still be able to block and then plunge down. Just gonna take a little bit of practice. So that's our one time action. All great options, and they all deal with, again, the V style opnamen. But there is another type of opnamen, and it can change things and it's gonna be a little more commonly seen, and that is the whirly gig. These are not historical terms, these are things I made up, but the whirly gig looks like this. So we come to bind, boom, I win. Rather than pulling back and cutting around, He's going to raise his backhand in this sort of bogan look and then come around on this side. Now, the reason you're more commonly going to see this is because it's a grosser, a bigger motor motion, so it's easier to do. Um, it also does have some advantages. It covers you quite significantly. So if I go to do this against him, we come into bind, I've lost. This is keeping me very safe for most of the cut, 
it allows me to take a much bigger step. And then on my cut, I've got a lot more energy to it. Were I in the position to end somebody, I might go for this for purpose of putting more force into putting them down. In competition, don't do that. In competition instead, a way to make this safer without braining the opponent is, as I step out to the side, rather than using all these muscles to cut, I'm going to just pull on the pommel and extend, which is a much lighter hit to do, but still gets the point across, literally. Now, like I said, the whirly gig is the more common one you're gonna see because bigger motor motion. It does also have another place it will come up, which is if someone is really pressing into your blade, or if you are deceiving them into doing so. So, Jake here is a very strong guy. He's got a very good Zornhau, um, even if he doesn't believe it. But if I know for a fact that if we come into a bind, I'm gonna lose, um, which is a good assessment for some fighters, what I will do is I will lighten my strike as we come in, let him push down, and then slip out of it using this whirly gig. So here's what that looks like. So from his perspective, what it feels like is we met the sword and then the sword just kind of kept going down, which is what he wanted. He wanted to get me low and then thrust. Then by the time he's realized something's wrong, my cut has already landed in his head. This exact move almost got me a medal in my very first tournament. <laughs> now, either way, the whirly gig has its place. But an important thing to remember about it is that it is a bigger motion and it does leave you open in some new ways. So let's go over how to deal with those. So the first one requires usually your opponent is taking a wider step with a whirly gig. So uh, let's go ahead and show them what we mean by wider step. So we're coming in, boom, he's getting all the way off to my side, all the way off to this new line. And the reason I want that is because against this, I have a tempo to take his hands. But the wider his step, the more time I will have to do so. So as that cut's coming around, I'm going to be springing as far to this side, almost kind of past him, as I can. This is to ensure that I have the most amount of time to hit that target without getting hit myself. So, let's take a look. We're here. Boom, he comes around. I've hit the hands and I've gotten away from the sword. Now, where you're targeting here can vary. In this case, I hit about here and then uh, as well onto the bottom hand. Hitting here gives you the most noise, but the least control, because it will usually just slide off onto his sword or bounce. Hitting here, in between kind of the, the edge of this and his wrist, tends to push his arm down, which is excellent, because that gives me control over where his cut is going, which is what I want. Now, the further to the side you spring, the safer you are, because his cut is going to continue to go down. So let's show that. All right, I'm all the way out of there as soon as I can. Now, sometimes you're going to get that controlling cut, other times you're just going to get a quick bop, and then you're out of there. It will vary. So, let's look at our other option, which is, okay, we're not going to take this opportunity because he's not stepping as far. We're now going to go into a combo that I used way too much when I was younger and still use, which is I'm going to block here, then I'm going to catch, then I'm going to repost. I call it uh, a door and a roof. So, we come in. Boom, he goes to take off. I'm going to step, and at the same time, I'm going to fold up into essentially a bogan. Now, I like to do this with the flat of my sword, so that way he slides off as he cuts, and I like to put my thumb on there to reinforce, so that way I'm as strong as I can be. And then as he slides, I just step out, cut the head, cut the arm, whatever is really available. It's a very quick, uh, very simple to do sort of combination. And I find that most people find it easier to do initially because training your brain to go one, two, where I'm turning the long edge out, tends to take a little bit of time versus training someone to go one, two, it's very light. The sword doesn't weigh anything, tip is forward. I'm just raising the pommel again as I step past it. So here's what that guy looks like. One, two, three. In this case, I ended up taking the hands because we were dis uh, dis dis Decent distance. English is hard sometimes. Now, the question you may be wondering is, okay, these are great. What do we do? Can we use the other responses that we learned earlier? Yes, we can. We can indeed. In fact, they usually work a little bit better because now we have more time. So let's look at those. So, 
One, boom, pop, cut. No problem whatsoever. Option two, boom, catch, thrust. Also great. Sometimes you may even have what happened there, which is I caught more toward the tip of his sword. That just makes your wind even easier. And then final one, the one tempo, boom, lunge. All the great stuff. So, those are just some general options, and your mileage with them may vary depending upon who you're fighting. Sometimes one may become more apparent, sometimes you'll find you did the wrong one at the wrong time. Just practice and get used to them and have them in your toolkit because, like I said, that one, the door in the roof, I used it way too much when I was younger, but every once in a while it comes up again and I'm like, kind of glad I know that one. But either way, uh, thank you very much to Jake who ran off out of camera, but we'll go over some other techniques and great stuff another time.